True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht and you're listening to a Spotlight Minisode in which we discuss cases that are in the media at the moment and topics related to true crime. This episode is sponsored by the upcoming new release movie, Last Seen Alive. After Will Spann's wife suddenly vanishes at a gas station, his desperate search to find her leads him down a dark path, which forces him to run from authorities and take the law into his own hands. The movie stars Gerard Butler and Jamie Alexander and releases in cinemas nationwide on the 17th of June, which is the day of the week movies are always released in South Africa. However, because of the public holiday on the 16th of June, South Africans will be able to catch Last Seen Alive in cinemas on the public holiday, so the Thursday already. And in case you're wondering if I've got tickets to give away, yes, yes I do. Three lucky True Crime South Africa listeners have the chance to win a set of double tickets for you and your bestie to watch Last Seen Alive. The competition is currently running on all our social media platforms and closes on the 14th of June. So head over to those socials right now to enter and be prepared this time to do a bit of sleuthing to qualify for your entry. A huge thank you to Last Seen Alive for supporting True Crime South Africa. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Francine, Sonique Forster, Annette Fenter, Kim Abrams, Desiree O'Leary, Angelique Fenter, Michelle, Debbie, Kelly McMaster, Michelle Rubat, Sunay Swart, Tando, Tando Ngiba, Monique Urquhart, Lizelle Fancel, Maxime Marifiotti, Renal Lindol, Alicia Bubalo, Lene Larson and Mariska de Jong for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much for your support, everyone. It really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. In addition to the shout-out and monthly exclusive episode that Patreons get, I also now upload an ad-free version of every week's episode to Patreon. So if you prefer not to hear the ads head over to Patreon and sign up for a minimum monthly contribution of just $1, which at the moment is about 16 rand. It's a pretty good deal. If you like discounts, who doesn't, head over to King Online for your health and beauty needs, print crowd for all your printing requirements, and use the code TCSA10 at checkout for 10% discounts and support the show at the same time. And you can get 10% off when you order from Wallpaper Online by using the code TRUECRIME at checkout. Other forms of support that make a huge difference include following the show on social media, inviting your friends, family, postman, hairdresser and parole officer to listen, and leaving reviews on the podcast platform you use. I wanted to start off today's Spotlight Minisode with an issue that I think about and talk about quite a lot. Well, really it's a few different issues combined, but recently they all led to a pretty brutal and senseless murder. If you follow the show on any of its social media platforms, especially Facebook, you'll know that I'm quite regulated about the types of posts I allow on the group. Some may say annoying, and that's fine too. Something that I always want to be sure of is that only validated information is shared on the group. Fake news is a huge issue. And yes, there are people out there that will write and create completely false information just to see how far it can spread or how many likes and clicks they can get. 
A slight sidebar on that, and many of you may already know this, but people often wonder why anyone would want to create fake news articles, videos, etc. Well, as with most things, there can be a financial motive. A lot of digital content, like articles and videos, are monetized by what's called pay-per-click. People earn money from advertisers for every time their article or piece of content is clicked on. Today, anyone can create a website in minutes. Once that website is created, they can start spreading content immediately. They can create anything they want. Articles that aren't true, or partially true. And what makes people click on content usually? Sensational headlines. Say anything horrific, slanderous or salacious in a headline about children, animals or the elderly especially, or any issue that tends to divide, like racism, homophobia and the like, and people will click and share. As a result, the person on the other end of that earns money. So that's one of the reasons people create fake or partially true news. Now a similar thing happens on social media with individuals as well as groups. Social media can be monetized too, and you, the user, are the product. Your eyes, clicks and shares are constantly making a ching-ching sound in someone else's bank account. If someone, or a group, can gather hundreds of thousands of followers, they become valuable to companies and people who want to access that following. Unscrupulous people will use that and create shocking and salacious content to attract your likes, follows and shares. Because who doesn't want to read about the two-headed cow that held up a bank in Uppington, right? And then we share it because although there's a little niggle somewhere in our brain that tells us it may not be entirely true, we want to warn others about the two-headed bank robbing bovine, just in case. Because I don't want to be the one that didn't share and then someone else got hurt because of it. But what if the hurting is the sharing? Up until now, I've been talking mainly about social media and the internet. But the same applies to other social platforms like WhatsApp and Telegram those handy community groups we belong to? Very often those groups attract messages and voice notes that can be put in the very same class as the articles and social media stuff I mentioned before. They're anonymous, sometimes a result of broken telephone, and often incite people to fear or some preventative action. So what does all of this have to do with crime, you ask? Well, very recently, this vicious circle of unsubstantiated and blatantly false information resulted in the death of an innocent man. Parkwood is a suburb of Grassy Park in the Western Cape. As part of an area called the Cape Flats, Parkwood has experienced its issues with gangsterism, drugs and other issues, and as a result, its community, as is the case with many others in South Africa, has become bonded in their shared struggle against criminality. On Tuesday, the 31st of May, 2022, 30-year-old Abongile Mafalala left his home in Danoon near Table View in the Western Cape at 6am. Abongile had been working as a driver for an e-hailing service for two years. It helped him to provide for his family and his girlfriend, Zandile. He went wherever the business was, and on that day, he would receive a ride request for two people in Parkwood. It is now alleged that the two men that Abongile received the request from were known criminals in the Parkwood community, but he would never know that. Abongile could also never know that as as he drove down the N7, which would connect him with the highway to Grassy Park, that a storm was brewing in Parkwood at that very moment. 
For the past few days, messages and voice notes had been doing the rounds on community groups, claiming that there'd been several attempted abductions of children in the area. A vehicle description was provided, which really could have been almost any white four-door car. Besides being vague on details, the messages were also anonymous, but community members shared them from forum to forum, and it would be that sharing by neighbours they knew and trusted that would attach some form of legitimacy to the messages. Well, Chris from next door shared it, and he got it from his auntie, so it must be true. A current of fear for the safety of children had started to run through Parkwood, which was already constantly on alert for acts of violence. People wanted to know how they could stop this rot from spreading through their neighbourhood. How could they protect their children? As is so often the case in situations where children are at risk, I have no doubt that the usual comments of people who do harm to children don't deserve to live, or I'll kill them with my own bare hands, were added into the mix. Yes, yes, the residents agreed. They would not allow this to happen in their streets. As the fervour was building in separate homes in Parkwood, spilling onto WhatsApp groups and social media, Abumgile Mafalala drove his white four-door vehicle into Parkwood. He would likely have double-checked the location for his pickup, maybe let his customers know that he was close by. But the two men that had called for him were not on time, or maybe by the time they arrived, the mob was already there. While a police investigation is still being conducted into exactly what the sequence of events was that led to more than 100 residents of Parkwood arriving at the area where Abongile was parked, we know that as he waited for his customers to arrive, he suddenly found himself surrounded. It would emerge that somehow Abongile had been fingered as someone involved in the alleged attempted abductions in the area. Messages and calls pinged from phone to phone until an enormous group of people gathered around the man's car demanding that he get out. Now we already know that Abongile was in no way involved in anything criminal, least of all child abduction. And in fact, the South African Police Service would later say that there had been no attempted abductions in the area for a very long time. But those initial fake news messages, combined with a vague vehicle description sucked from someone's thumb, created the perfect storm, and Abongile was now at the centre of it. As he protested his innocence, residents of Parkwood pulled him from his vehicle. Someone was filming, and the video would later also be shared on WhatsApp and social media. Abongile was mercilessly beaten and robbed. Then the unthinkable. The mob pushed the man back into his car and set it alight. Abongile was burned beyond recognition. Police would advise his family of his death later that day, but his four sisters did not know how to tell Abongile's girlfriend, so she would find out when the horrific video was shared on WhatsApp and a neighbour saw it. Fourteen people were arrested within hours of Abongile's murder, and police say they expect to arrest more as their investigations continue. Mob justice has become a huge issue in South Africa, and many claim that it is a community's way of standing up for themselves in a country where, for the most part, people don't feel they can trust police or the justice system to attend to crime. But which is worse? a criminal walking the streets, or an innocent man, beaten, brutalised, terrified, and then burned to death. The irony for me 
is that in claiming that they were protecting their children, every single one of the people who stood around Abongile's car that day became criminals themselves. They are now no better than the gangsters they claim to hate so much. Because motive does not excuse an act as violent and horrific as that. And I can guarantee you that Abongile's family don't really care that those people thought they were meeting out justice that day. And as much as people might say, well, sometimes we have to take the law into our own hands. No, you really don't. If that's what we want, then let's dismantle everything. Let's no longer have police, a justice system. Let's turn the jails into shopping centres. And we'll all just sort each other out, as and when we see fit. Sounds great, until it's you that's on the wrong end of the mob. Abungile's death was the culmination of a string of events. It started with the creation of rumours. It continued with the people who shared the rumours without asking questions. It was fueled by the people who said they should get to decide who lives and dies. And then it was ignited by the fervour of mob mentality. I really feel like, if nothing else, this case needs to be a legal precedent for what happens to people that blindly engage in these fear creation campaigns. Perhaps if the country sees someone facing prison time for their part in a murder that started on a WhatsApp group or social media page, we will start to realise that we cannot continue to do this. Question everything. And if someone does not want you to question, then ask yourself why. Because the odds that you're ever going to save someone's life by sharing an anonymous and unsubstantiated voice note are almost zero. But the odds that that message could cost someone their life are frighteningly high. Rest gently, Abongile Mafalala. This week, a young man was sentenced in a case that started in 2020. The crime and attempted family murder had taken the life of the offender's mother and his father had barely survived. On the 9th of January 2020, Ruan van Heerden, who was 17 at the time, got into an argument with his mother, who'd accused him of stealing 200 rand from her wallet. Van Heerden had only recently come from a stay at a rehabilitation facility to help treat his substance use disorder, and when his parents, Barney and Machta, noticed the money missing, they feared that Ruan was using drugs again and confronted him. The argument went nowhere, and Ruan left the house, angry, and met up with some of his friends. Machter, who was living with the autoimmune disease lupus, had gone to sit in the lounge of her home at that point, and her husband Barney had gone to bed. At 11pm that night, Ruan returned home, but he was not alone. He was accompanied by his friend, Colson Phelps. When the two boys entered the home, Ruan almost immediately attacked his mother in the lounge. He stabbed her more than 30 times with a knife he'd taken from their own kitchen. At the same time, Colson was beating Barney with a golf club in the bedroom. When Ruan finished stabbing his mother, he joined Colson in the bedroom and stabbed his father too. The pair then stole several items from the home, including Ruan's parents' vehicle, and fled the scene. Both Machta and Barney initially survived the attack on them by their own son and were able to inform the police of the identity of their attackers. Ruan was arrested shortly afterwards when he used his father's bank card to book a 600-kilometre Uber trip from Pretoria to Aliwal North, and his friend Colson was arrested not long after. At one point, Ruan's girlfriend was also arrested but only charged with being in possession of stolen property, and it doesn't appear that these charges were carried through. 
The charges against Ruan and Colson were initially attempted murder and several charges related to robbery. But by November 2021, those charges were converted to one of murder and one of attempted murder. Although Barney recovered from the physical attack on him, his wife, Machta, suffered several permanent injuries, which, when paired with her lupus, resulted in her being readmitted to hospital on several occasions. Eventually, in November 2021, after having been in hospital for four months, Machta passed away. Doctors and a pathologist were able to confirm that her death had been as a direct result of the stab wounds inflicted upon her by her son, and had she not been attacked, she would not have died when she did. With this clarification on record, police and prosecutors escalated the charges against both boys. Ruan's attorney had requested a psychiatric evaluation be conducted on the boy, and he was found to be fit to stand trial, as well as criminally responsible for his actions at the time of the crime. It would emerge that Ruan had not been the Van Heerden's biological son, but he'd been adopted by them when he was a young child, as Machta had been unable to bear children due to her lupus. Ruan claimed that when he was in the rehab facility, a counsellor there had threatened him that if he didn't get his substance use disorder in check, his parents would give him up for adoption. Now, we don't know if this was really said to the boy, but even if it was, it's likely that the counsellor was using it as a pretty horrible threat. In South Africa, adoptive parents have a two-year period in which they can apply to have adoptions reversed. Outside of that period, only four adoptions have ever been reversed in South African legal history, according to the spokesperson for the Social Development Ministry. And these were in very severe cases, in which abuse had been inflicted upon the adoptive parents by the child in question. In Ruan's case, he was already 17, and considering his parents were going to the trouble and expense of putting him through drug rehabilitation, I seriously doubt that they were then going to start a lengthy and expensive process with little chance of success to reverse his adoption. Either way, Ruan's defence attorney would claim this as a mitigating circumstance in his sentencing phase. Ruan did enter in, into a plea deal with the state in which he admitted his guilt and expressed his remorse at his actions. As a result, he was handed down a cumulative sentence of 30 years, of which 20 will involve direct imprisonment. In his victim impact statement, Barney van Heerden said that he'd been left traumatised and emotionally bereft by the incident, and that he now considered himself a childless widower. Ruan's co-accused Colson Phelps has refused all offers of plea deals and has opted to proceed to trial instead. His trial was due to start this week. And that is your Spotlight mini sewed for the week. I might be a little bit off the map until the end of this month, although I'll still be producing episodes, because I'm working on a very exciting project, which I know you're all going to enjoy. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Lived Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.